Whenever I need B-roll of a quality street, I always show off this section of downtown Carson City spanning from Sophia Street to West 5th Street. This portion of Carson Street features two narrow lanes with slow moving car traffic, wide sidewalks, a plaza, and plenty of other points of interest surrounding the street. To me, this is the ideal street. There are a lot more people around than usual since it is a built environment that actually encourages people to get around outside of a car. As nice as the street is now, it was not always this way. Prior to 2016, this portion of Carson Street used to be a hideous four-lane strode that tore through the downtown area. The sidewalks were narrow, so there wasn't much space to walk in groups. At one point, they were fenced off from the main strode to deter people from crossing wherever. Instead of a pedestrian plaza, the space between the Fox and the Mom and Pop Diner used to be a mere parking lot. The strode effectively killed everything that made the downtown a downtown. Instead of being a lively, pedestrian-focused urban core, it was a place for cars with no consideration for anyone else. I have received comments from people saying they are baffled by the concept of strodes. The circumstances for why they are created will differ from strode to strode. For this one, Carson Street is technically a part of US Business Route 395. Originally, it was a two-lane road, as shown by this postcard from the 1950s, but it was eventually expanded to four lanes. So most of Carson's residents only ever saw it as a four-lane highway running through the center of town. As Carson City grew, it poked more streets and driveways into the US 395, slowly transforming it from a road into more of a strode. For decades, there weren't any changes to ensure that it remains as a street or a road, so it ended up being what we see today. For the longest time, this is all Carson City amounted to be. An ugly, car-infested town with ubiquitous parking lots and strodes. And it's especially hurt the downtown area. Discussions of revising the downtown didn't really begin until the start of the Carson Bypass, an expensive $260 million project that sought to expand the I-580 from Arrowhead Drive to Spooner Summit. At the time, up to 50,000 cars and trucks would drive through downtown Carson City every day. The bypass would allow up to 40,000 cars a day to avoid driving through Carson Street. After this portion of the project was completed, and the I-580 was expanded to Fairview Drive, the state of Nevada would relinquish a portion of Carson Street so the city would gain ownership, thus leading to talks on narrowing Carson Street. In September 2005, the city held an open house to collect public feedback on how Carson Street should be improved for the future. The blog post around Carson has archived photos from the event. People would be drawn to the downtown more often if there was less traffic, more parking, more business choices, and if the downtown was generally more pleasant. Based on the outcome of this meeting, there was demand for changes and new developments along Carson Street to make it a more attractive place overall. On April 2006, a new master plan for the city was adopted. This master plan had a guiding principle for how to improve downtown for the coming decades. This included reducing the number of restrictions on what can be developed downtown to open up more opportunities for residential buildings and more mixed-use developments. It called for creating a more pedestrian-friendly environment by reducing Carson Street from four lanes to two lanes. And it called for creating more public spaces and recreational amenities by reclaiming some of the space for parking so it can instead be parks or plazas. It seemed like a better Carson Street was actually going to happen in the near future as it had backing from city leaders and its residents. Unfortunately, not everyone was happy with the proposed changes. According to a poll from the Nevada Appeal, out of 498 participants, 378 of them were against reducing Carson Street to two lanes after the freeway expansion. Typical complaints were a matter of increasing traffic and making it harder to enter the downtown. People liked the design, while others didn't like adding more congestion to the downtown area, even if some of it would be relieved by the Carson Bypass. 
To better understand the implications of narrowing Carson Street, the city performed a traffic study and published this report in May 2007. The city projected that narrowing Carson Street would offset traffic to Stewart and Roop Streets. This report discusses how Roop Street may need to be widened by 2030 in order to accommodate the increased traffic as an unfortunate trade-off of a narrow downtown street. Nonetheless, this report did demonstrate that placing Carson Street on a road diet is feasible while still accommodating traffic for the next few decades. To better understand public opinion of the proposed changes, Tahoe Daily Tribune reported on the plan with the opening line saying, City officials want to make Carson Street less attractive to drivers simply passing through by diverting some autos and trucks now using it to other locations so downtown businesses can lure more shoppers. This line kind of bothers me because the moment a driver steps out of their vehicle, they are no longer a driver. They are a pedestrian who gets to experience the same problems as any other person in the downtown area. And the opening line to this report kind of neglects that. Joe McCarthy, the city's business development manager, said that it's more of a matter of turning that unhealthy, unsafe street into a robust, vital, and economically sound street. The planned revisions were not supposed to make downtown less attractive for drivers. They were about creating a built environment that people want to be in when they are outside of a vehicle. Sadly, that didn't quite come across to other residents. Carolyn Tate, a Nevada Appeal columnist, disagreed with the changes by saying, It just seems crazy to me. The town won't go backwards. As though to suggest that a four-lane strode with fenced-off sidewalks is somehow superior than a two-lane street that prioritizes the comfort of people. Fortunately, other people referenced in this article were excited for the change. Michelle Robbins, owner of Hannafin's Arts and Antiques, says it's one of the best friggin' ideas I've ever heard. While Christy Cervati, marketing director for the Horseshoe Club, believes less traffic and wider sidewalks would make downtown more of a destination. This began to paint one of the major roadblocks with narrowing Carson Street. Not everyone was happy about the change, and there was a lot of uncertainty with what narrowing would mean for different businesses along the main street. Even though it was adopted in the city's master plan, transforming Carson Street from a four-lane strode to a two-lane street was not going to be as smooth of a process as people would hope. Not much happened with the idea for the next few years, as the city had to wait to gain ownership of Carson Street. Fast forward to September 2010, when the I-580 was expanded to Fairview Drive, allowing the city to move forward with plans to narrow Carson Street, the Nevada Appeal published this article titled, Business Owners Divided Over Carson Street Plan. City officials estimated that the Carson Bypass successfully removed 10,000 vehicles a day from Carson Street, which was an important step to continue plans to narrow the street. However, residents and business owners had mixed opinions on the concept. A common complaint was taking away the parking. It's such a weird complaint to me. If someone can't find parking in Carson City, they aren't looking hard enough. Parking is littered all around the downtown, in front of the Nugget, along side streets, next to pawn shops. It's everywhere. And the sad thing is, all of these lots will probably only be full one day a year during the Nevada Day Parade. That's about it. Carson City doesn't have too little parking. It has way too much of it. Some people were also apprehensive of having fewer cars heading through the downtown, especially if they were a part of auto-centric businesses. The manager of the Arco AMPM gas station was upset that the bypass has taken away 20% of his business. It's just ridiculous, he said. I don't understand why they don't just make downtown a car-free zone. Let's just go no cars in Carson City. How does that sound? Fantastic. If anything, this complaint demonstrates how much car-centric services are at odds with pedestrianized areas. Unlike restaurants or stores, gas stations require people arriving by car. When those cars go away, so does their clientele. So they will do whatever it takes to prevent changes that reduce the amount of through traffic. Other complaints were a matter of just not getting it. 
The owner of Lily's China Bistro can be quoted for saying, Why change it? I don't understand. For what reason? Honestly, I don't blame anyone for being ignorant. These urban planning topics weren't exactly popular back in the mid-2000s, and it especially wasn't as easy to actually find information about them unless you were actively going out of your way. I mentioned this in a previous video, but I am glad that it is now much easier to learn about these same concepts. It is crucial to educate as many people as possible so they can understand how turning a strode into a street is beneficial for everyone. It's hard to rally people up against the status quo when they don't know why the status quo is bad. Even though urban planning topics weren't as popular or widely available as they are now, there were still several online personas taking their time to try to share why they were in favor of the narrowing. The blog post, Muscle Powered, wrote a response suggesting opponents of narrowing Carson Street only want to travel through town. They don't want to stop at the local businesses in downtown that have made a commitment to the economic and social health of the town. They just want to dash from the large businesses at one end of town to the same sort of businesses at the far end of town. They go on to discuss how they want a healthy Carson City with a real community, saying, We have allowed Carson City to spread out, to separate work from home from commerce, and have built a place that works well for cars, but not for people. Now that the economy has slowed, I think we can really see the folly of that sprawl. We have become very car dependent, but cars are letting us down. In addition to this poster, Anne Marquis, a board member and founder of Muscle Powered, later shared an anecdote about Carson Street. When my kids were young, I didn't let them cross Carson Street. I saw it as a big river cutting our town in half. Dangerous, sometimes fatal to cross. I still wince when I drive by and see a cluster of kids walking home from school, waiting at Carson Street, trying to cross. Or when I see the rare tourist who ventures out on foot in downtown Carson City, trying to cross Carson Street on one of those mid-block crosswalks. I have the old-fashioned notion that the streets of Carson City should be safe and convenient for all users, not just for cars and trucks. It is sad that narrowing Carson Street is viewed as going backwards or being old-fashioned. The four-lane highway was a mistake. Just because a street is technically a highway doesn't mean it should be treated as one. If anything, narrowing Carson Street was fixing an error from the past. Still, despite people in favor of change, years would pass without any meaningful improvements to Carson City's downtown. In an attempt to get more of the town's residents on board with improving Carson Street, Doreen Mack of Lofty Expressions formed an advocacy group called Downtown 2020, which consisted of 49 businesses and 11 business owners. On April 17th, there was an interesting meeting with the Board of Supervisors, which ended with a decision to tear down the iron fences between the sidewalks and Carson Street. As if people knew that something should change with Carson Street, even if they couldn't agree on narrowing the lanes. Doreen Mack later pleaded with Carson City residents to accept the changes to Carson Street in this editorial. The Downtown 2020 is a group of concerned and motivated citizens and business people supported by many downtown businesses and building owners. We understand the importance of having a successful downtown that supports the existing businesses and recruits new ones. This community feeling will radiate out to other areas of our city, making Carson a destination place that's a desirable and safe place to live and visit. Everyone should have the opportunity you had to create memories for your children and grandchildren in an environment that's conductive to creating memories. This needs to begin now. On November 6, 2014, there was a meeting for narrowing Carson Street. It started with Doreen Mack discussing the community effort behind the proposed design and encouraging the board to approve it. Talks went back and forth for around 40 minutes. As expected, there was a mixture of people who were opposed to changing Carson Street and people who wanted it to be reduced to two lanes. When it finally came down to a vote, the decision was approved four to one. 
after all these years of bickering about turning the main strode into a street, it was actually going to happen. Construction of the revised Carson Street broke ground on March 7th, 2016, and the new pedestrian-friendly corridor opened on October 28th, just in time for that year's Nevada Day Parade. Looking back, I don't think people would want it to go back to four lanes. A two-lane street with slow traffic, wide sidewalks, and a pedestrianized plaza makes it a much better place to be in than a strode that tears through downtown. I have received comments asking how or even if car-dependent North America could ever be fixed. Change is possible, but there are a lot of hurdles that must be cleared first. Narrowing Carson Street was delayed by the bureaucracy of who owned Carson Street and the logistics of rerouting through traffic. Once those two barriers were cleared, with the expansion of the I-580, the final obstacle was Carson City's addiction to cars. Opponents of narrowing Carson Street and relinquishing some of the parking saw the downtown as a place to drive through, with no consideration for what it was like to live there. It was a terrible place to be outside of a vehicle, yet these city's residents have grown so accustomed to cars that they couldn't fathom there being a benefit to having fewer of them in one part of town. So, how do you kill a Strode? Well, it requires a combination of collective organizing and pressuring political leaders and city council members. Residents of Carson City did show up to various meetings to advocate for narrowing the street, but there were still a lot of ignorant folks around town who were against any kind of change. Either they were afraid of what it meant for downtown businesses, or they didn't want to have a longer commute driving through downtown. It is imperative to educate as many people as possible for why the Strode must be turned into a street or a road. Some may be against change out of ignorance, and they may be willing to change their mind after acquiring new information. Sharing videos and posts across social media platforms is a great start to encouraging people to speak up in favor of improving the places they live. People must later show up to community meetings and town halls to make it clear that there is demand for these changes. NIMBYs will always come out in opposition to anything that changes the neighborhood character. So if you actually want housing projects, transit projects, and road diets, there needs to be a group of people who can overpower the NIMBYism. They also need to participate in elections, even if it is just at the municipal level. Voting is important, and everyone should exercise their right to register, fill out a ballot, and drop it in the mailbox. Finally, the elected must be held accountable to deliver on their promises. Linked in the description is an article by David Sirota that explains this concept further. I do recommend giving it a read to know where I'm coming from when I say that you have to hold the elected accountable. I feel like some people have given up on the electoral process because there are no consequences if someone fails to accomplish their elected duties. We, as voters, must act as that accountability factor. Politicians respond to power, and if investing into good urban planning projects is what gives them power, then hopefully that would entice more politicians to back good urban planning projects. Once competent leadership who is willing to reduce people's dependency on cars is in office, they must then begin reducing how much through traffic there is along the arterial strodes. The catalyst that opened up discussions to narrow Carson Street was extending the I-580, which reduced through traffic along the main street. However, vehicles shouldn't exclusively be rerouted with more freeways, as they only induce demand for more driving. The city center must be easily accessible without a car. When the only way to get to different places is by driving, some people are going to interpret a road diet or removing a parking lot as an attack on their personal freedom to get around. They may be more accepting of change if they weren't so reliant on cars just to get anywhere. However, not everyone will change their minds and accept changes that reduce car dependency. Some people are going to be against any kind of change that doesn't prioritize car infrastructure, as they see large parts of where they live as places to drive through, not an environment people live in. This is where city leaders shouldn't bend over backwards and feed into the addiction on cars. 
When there is support from a city's residents to create more nice car light or car free places, city leaders should push forward and install the progressive change that our cities desperately need to see. Relinquishing space from cars is a controversial action, but it is one that must be done, even if it means upsetting suburbanites who only want to strode to drive through. Hopefully, through advocating for change and influencing political leaders, more improvements can be laid down, thus over time creating a better city to live for everyone.